So, <coughs> um, I've called it activating. And it, it is dormant, the spirit of place, unless you activate it, because it's there. And we know it's there, because writers, artists, have this capacity to transcend more the kind of reality that they see into what might be called a deeper sense of what's germinating in a place. Um, <coughs> it's very interesting, there's a lovely story about Turner, who started off as a very um, pedantic illustrator, really, and he only drew what he saw. And uh, for that reason, he worked in an architectural practice. And after a few years, he realized that this really wasn't for him, because he was drawing not what he saw, but what was expected to be presented by other people. So there was a kind of realism that they were expecting. But he didn't see that. He saw something beyond the realism, which you could call impressionism later on. So he left the architectural practice and started to become a freelance artist. And <coughs> there's this lovely story where John Ruskin, who really invented art appreciation, was taken around by his father in the kind of sherry truck, because his father was delivering sherry to all the beautiful manorial uh, homes of southern England. And, um, and he'd been given, John Ruskin, a little illustration of some of uh, the, the kind of nice places in England, which had been illustrated by Turner. And at this point, Turner had gone beyond being a kind of graphic artist, an illustrator, to being what you might call more of an impressionist. So little John, precocious guy, I tell you, only 13 years of age, said to his dad, Turner hasn't drawn it correctly, Dad. So his father said, mm, yes, no. Well, you see, Turner could see it and see beyond it. So jo little John Ruskin at 13 said, no, that's not good enough. I, I Look, here's the picture, Dad, and here's the landscape. They don't match up. And actually, from that point onwards, you could say that there was such a thing as art criticism. So what was John Ruskin, um, what was Turner, sorry, being able to portray that had content, had uh, accuracy, but was in addition to what we all normally see? Now, <coughs> this is a very interesting kind of conversation, really, because um, at the end of the kind of realistic period in English art and kind of... Uh, poetry, I suppose, just before more the Romantics came on stream, um, the idea was to be scientific and accurate and only do what it is you saw. And yet, if you go into the ancient cultures, they're not so much interested in what's seen, but what's felt, what they might say is present, what is powerful in what you might even call an emanation of the place. What is it contributing? And if we go back <coughs> into the most ancient history, um, you can come across one of these wonderful kind of little monoliths. And the ancient people put a poem. It's a poem. It's a statement. It's a script. Is it a map? What are they doing? But if these are maps, how do we understand it? And we start to say, well, take the idea that it is a map. What are we looking at? Well, we've got two quite interesting lines. Vertical. We've got a cross, crossing, a horizontal. Oh, sorry, okay, can we go back? Yeah, I mean, so that's the problem. If you touch it... I won't touch it. <laughs> it, it <laughs> that's right. Except when you want to make okay. <coughs> And it's got this kind of sense of ascendancy. And then it's got something coming in from the more horizontal. So it's kind of embraced. So there's this pillar, a script. It's a marker. Maybe what we call a, a waystone later on, or a, um, a roll-right stone, or, which I think is not far from here. The roll-right stones are not far from here. So these are places 
in which there's a signature to be recognized, an emanation, a quality, uh, an influence, possibly, <coughs> or a marker for a sacred quality. And I'm interested in that because, and this might be quite a jump, I work with biographies, young people, whose biographies are really challenged. And my contract with local authorities and the government is to do something about it. So what are you going to do, Angus? What are you going to do, Ruskin Mill? Well, we offer a journey. And on this journey, there are stages. And there are thresholds. And there are events. And there are casualties. And there are opportunities for celebration. And so this pathway and this journey, if it's done out of context, I'm only repeating the journey that's been out of context before they came to me and kind of reinforcing a kind of sense of dislocation and disturbance because it's not in situ, it's not in context. And I think that word context is crucial. If things are in context, they have a kind of vibrancy. And if things are out of context, after 30 years of this work, I can, you know you can tell within 20 seconds. That's my job. Are things in context? Are things in relational capacity to be evolutic? Or denuded? So we get this sense of being able to recognize qualities and essences and <coughs> I once had the most wonderful experience with a really skilled tree uh, surgeon. And he was, you know, right at the end of his life, been doing it all his life. And he could tell me and show me a tree that was not healthy. And I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the ilf, as John Ruskin said, around that tree. And I was furious at myself, because I can see health in my young people. It's my job. But I couldn't recognize what was not healthy about that tree, but he could. And he said, it's dying. I go, how do you know that? Little signatures. Tiny little kind of markers of things that weren't quite right. The shape, where the branches came up, the stress levels, he could see everything. And it was as if he could also sense the quality before it even materialized on a kind of branch, leafy level as well. So we had this kind of nose, or you might call it. So are these guys in the ancient past <coughs> giving us a script of something that we have to learn to interpret and encode? And is it, is it their poetry? Is it their, is it their sculptures that are giving them um, a way mark for a certain quality and power. Um, <coughs> I'm really leaving that as a question, except when I look at this, I can never get tired of it. In fact, I've got it in my room and I look at it regularly in the mornings. And I'm not sure why, but it's giving me something. It's giving me, how do I learn to look into something that I have no comprehension of, and yet I know there's something very powerful and specific in this. And it is about very simple structures. The vertical pillar, the base, the wonderful way in which the emanation from the pillar radiates out left and right, and it has this opportunity of ascendancy, a little node. Okay. So I'm calling it activating the genus loci. Uh, no. There we go. So I've been doing some work in China. And I've had the most wonderful time with Chinese people. Totally unexpected. I thought they would all be kind of industrialized out of that kind of sense of for place. And my job has been to actually literally put the clay of the Yangtze River back in their hands and make pots as part of their reconnecting to place because they feel um, migrants in their own land. That's what they say to me. We're a migrant. We've been kind of you know, pushed out of our localities. And 
they have. So there was a public, uh, beautiful public uh, statue of Confucius. And this is really interesting. No matter where you go, there you are. There you are in place. Only it could be argued that perhaps for most of the time we are not really there. Now that's really interesting to me. Yeah. Perhaps we do not really experience or become conscious of the place that we are in. Now he summed it up. I can't, I can't, I can't qualify that better. The most beautiful text for me. And that's 500, 600 BC? The level of consciousness in that sense of uh, articulation of, so do you know where you are? That's such an interesting question, because it's got many ramifications. Um, <coughs> so if you talk to a, as I have done on a couple of occasions, to a group of entrepreneurs, they all have one thing in common. It's not about money. It's about doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. And if you know how to do it, and you can keep knowing how to do it, you'll just grow. They all say it's an evolutic principle, and they're absolutely right. Now, my motivation for doing it might be very different from theirs, but it is a method. And it's a business method, and it's an acceleration method to actually achieve possibly um, greater results. And in effect, I've practiced that at Ruskin Mount, and I can tell you it works. Yeah? Because if you know when to place an idea in the right place, and you know how to connect it to the place, and you do it in a timely way, the effort involved is half of what might be, or even it's, it's, it's a minutiae of the effort that might be needed if you're actually doing it out of time and out of place. In fact, most things don't, don't even start growing when you do things out of time and out of place. So this is a, this is a, a, <coughs> a I'm expressing this to you as a bit of an entrepreneur myself, where um, in a way I need permission from the place to do what I do. And I'm going to come to that a little bit later on. So doing things without permission is an interesting idea. So <coughs> having looked at um, first American people who, you know, asked permission to cut the tree down, they wouldn't do anything without having permission to cut the tree down. The idea that you would be impounding the order of the natural world was not, it wasn't a concept that even existed in their culture. That's very interesting. So, do we know where we are? Um, can you become conscious of the place that we are in? And, and I'm going to continue the sentence that he hasn't said, <laughs> if I can be so uh, arrogant. Um, and may I have permission to recreate it? And if I do need it, which I think I do, how would I go about it? Very interesting. So if we think about Wrighton here, and there's now a university here, for me this is a very interesting sequence of events. I'm really intrigued to go right back to the Ice Age, because we did that in the Ruskin Mill Valley, which is where I started. We went right back, found all the signature plants after the periglacial period, and well, no, we discovered one plant after the periglacial period that was still there, which is a small leaf lime. And we had a wonderful botanist on our team who was able to more or less verify that with other pieces of research. So we have these small leaf limes in our wood that go back in succession to the periglacial period. And what we did then was to actually try and draw different time periods of how this valley evolved out of the periglacial period. And it was done as a collaborative <coughs> action inquiry with 30 members of staff. Some of the staff are still there and they're still driving the vision that was generated out of that. And it was to recreate a contemporary valley that is sustainable and ecological 
for the biography of the valley and the biography of the young people to have a handshake. The biography of the valley and the biography of the young people to have a handshake. That's actually what we created. A lot of hard work, but that's possibly where we're going. How do we become conscious of the place that we're in and how do we have permission to recreate it? Okay, so there's a challenge. <coughs> and um, it's a well-known challenge, which is after the kind of genius of medieval Europe, where if you take this leading, what you call today, um, genius and feminist, Hildegard of Bingen, who said that she herself could be a creator. She didn't need the Pope to tell her how to be a creator. So the word I goes in. It's really powerful. I, the fiery life of <coughs> divine wisdom. I ignite the beauty of the plains. I sparkle the waters. I burn in the sun with the moon and the stars. With wisdom I order all rightly. I adorn the earth. I am the breeze that nurtures all things green. I am the rain coming from the dew that causes the grasses to laugh with the joy of life. I call forth the aroma of good work and tears. I am the yearning for good. So she nearly got her head cut off for this because there was no God. And I think it was pure circumstance that she survived, personally. However, she was the kind of definitive, there was a kind of definitive signature after this poem had been written because it caused a furore. <coughs> and um, you could say that she identified the relationship between the macro world and the micro world, herself and the universe. They actually had a kind of collaboration here in this poem. You could diagnose that. So a few, year, a few hundred years later, up comes Francis Bacon. And this is from a book on the um, rebirth of nature by Rupert Sheldrake. And um, it's in his book there. And the red is uh, Francis Bacon's language. And it's fairly shocking. I'm going to read it to you. Because these concepts, which are so different from those of Hildegard of Bingen, are inside every GCSE science curriculum. I think we have to recognize that. And that's quite disturbing, because it would seem that we haven't really got out of that paradigm yet. And is that part of, the, is that part of why you're here? To help shift that paradigm, you know? And personally, I think it is. That's one of the geniuses of this aspect of Coventry University. You're trying to shift the paradigm from this guy. Maybe more connected to what Hildegard of Bingen is, but that doesn't work unless it's authenticated, it's unless it's sort of, you know, uh, researched in a contemporary way. Um, so Francis Bacon, um, he proclaimed that nature exhibits herself more clearly under the trials and vexations of the mechanical devices than left to herself. That, you know, that was when technology was coming in and there was a kind of uh, s nature being subject to the mechanical arts. <coughs> then under the vexations, the mechanical devices then left to herself. In the Inquisition for Truth, nature's secret holes and corners were to be entered and penetrated. Hmm, think about that. Um, nature was to be bound into service and made a slave, put into constraint. She would be dissected and by mechanical arts and the hand of man, she would be freed out of her natural state and squeezed and moulded so that human power and knowledge meet as one. He wrote of a, sci of a, he wrote of a new science as a masculine birth that will issue in a blessed race of heroes and supermen. For what? Was he shot for that? Oh no, he was venerated, and still he's being venerated. Come on, he's our national export. He should have been. would do that first. He's our national hero. <laughs> but that is what was put into the university science curriculum. That is the paradigm. 
And it's not just in UK, it's everywhere. So when I go to India, you know, and I'm, again, I've been doing some work with autism in India, it's utterly shocking how they completely drink in everything from the UK. You can't even get a, an inflection of Hinduism in the science <laughs> curriculum. It's not allowed in. It's forbidden. It's like a kind of, it's, it's a cult. Our method is a cult, actually. So, and we haven't challenged that. I think your university is doing that. And it's bloody hard work. And, you know, Ruskin Mill employs a thousand staff. Every member of staff, for the first two weeks, before they get into their role, they go through a two-week induction. And what they do in that time is that they meet the first question. You actually have a choice to think about how the world is. That's the subtext. You do not have to think the way you think about the natural world. Now, I don't say that to people, because the induction process is to support an open question, which is, hmm, does it have to be like that? It's not a didactic relationship, it's a practical relationship. And the way we do it is to say, well, you know, up until now, under this method, the tree's cut down and it comes to the workshop and you see it as a rightful piece of power over the wood, power over the tree. And actually that's legitimate. But at Ruskin Mill, you will take a greenwood pole lathe to the tree. You will find a branch where you can find the elasticity and generative kind of tension and pressure, <coughs> so that when you drive the treadle with your foot, the pressure of the branch takes the elasticity back up so you can have another go and drive the pole lathe to make your three-legged chair. So you have to be connected to the tree. You're under the shelter of the tree and you might have harvested a little bit of the wood from the tree that needs harvesting to make your three-legged tree. So you are at one with the tree. You haven't impounded the tree, killed it, or brought it to the workshop. Now, by doing that reversal, something really interesting happens because the spirit of the tree and the spirit of the place are part of the honouring of our new relationship we need to, which we need to develop, which is evidently so clear, that this old creed needs review. Can I have permission to take the tension from the branch and drive the pole to make a, a three-legged stool with your surplus? <coughs> I'll show you how we, how we got to this point in a minute. Okay. So what I'm I mean, what I'm sh sharing with you now is 30 years of hard work, I tell you. And, <laughs> and do I, so when the new staff have done that, do you know there's no need for a conversation? They get it. It's a waste of time to have a conversation. It doesn't really work anymore anyway, because you get into kind of didactics. It's <laughs> the entry to offer this new sense of honouring of place is a performative relationship. It's not a conversation. However, the good news is that there's a whole plethora of new activists, particularly along the west coast of California. And they are brilliant people. They've got so much energy. They've got so much clarity. And Craig uh, Chalquist the author of Terra Psychology in Reengaging the Soul of the Place is one of the foremost current leading activists. And, um, and this whole question about how do you find the being of a place, the genus loci, the spirit in which 
the sense and dignity of locality can actually be a method not just to have a relationship with but to actually open up your eyes about how to work in the world full stop but also work with other human beings <coughs> and Gary Snyder you may have come across him this beautiful idea of the fluidity of place our place is part of what we are yet even a place as a kind of fluidity, it passes through space and time. So when you look at it, you've got to look at it, let's just see it over you know, a thousand years. What's it's actually in fluid morphing development. So we have a lot of supporters for this idea of rehonoring place, reanimating. David White, we might think of ourselves as each like a created geography, a confluence of inherited flows. Each one of us has a unique signature inherited from our ancestors, our landscape, our language. Underneath it, a half-hidden geology of existence. Memories, hurts, triumph, and stories in a lineage that have not yet been fully told. So he touches on something really tricky, which is... Um, the hurt of a place. We need to actually, we need to grapple that. Maybe we'll do it a little bit later on. But don't let me leave you without dealing with the hurt of the place. I mean, Coventry, we know, it was hurt. We, we, can we stand indifferently to that? I don't think so. Just in the same way that when the students come towards me, I have to deal with the hurt that's been perpetrated. And if I can actually find a, re uh, a restorative experience so that the hurt is not kind of put into didactic dialogue, which then, do you know those young people are so skilled they can outwit the psychologist? Because <laughs> they do. So how do, we, how do we overcome that? How do we come over the, overcome the hurt of a place and the hurt of a biography of a young person? Those are very interesting questions to me. We can look at it later. <coughs> mm, I'll do something here. It's quite controversial. I take this method to the US and I do a genus loci go back into the time and deal with the hurt of the first people from the Europeans. They don't want to know. They leave the room. Angus, just don't take us there. I'm still dealing with the problem. I'm not ready to face it. I go, okay. Who, who's in the room? Who wants to do this? Half the room have left in the past. It's really amazing. Totally. It's so powerful, it's so tangible, because it's right in front of them. Because if they hear the stories of what really happened in their community, they can't face it. And the, the tricky thing is, you can't pretend it isn't there. It's actually in the DNA of the, of the place. Or the, maybe call it the epigenetics of the place, put it that way. It's better. So he's, he's put his finger on something very powerful there. So, David Seaman, sense of belonging, a phenomenological perspective enlarges the emotional range of feelings that attach to place to include care, sentiment, concern, warmth, love, and sacredness. That's really important, sacredness. <coughs> D.H. Lawrence, different places on the face of the earth have different vital effluence, different vibration, different chemical exaltation. I love that. Different polarity with different stars. Call it what you like, but the spirit of place is a great reality. So it's taken poets, artists, to go beyond the kind of vis uh, visible to get behind what maybe is uh, generative. <coughs> so Goethe's an interesting guy. So is not the core of nature already in the heart of man? I'm still working that through. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of these enigmatic kind of texts where you go, hmm, 
I guess what you mean, but how do I make it conscious? How do I get there? How do I feel that? So he developed something called beholding. And Steve Tolbert from the Nature Institute in the US has tried to decipher beholding. There is a German word called Anschauen. Should have put it on there actually. Am I right? Is that have I pronounced it? Anschauen? So it, it's interesting because you can't really translate that in English. So the Germans have something actually highly sophisticated here, which is a quality <coughs> of connectivity in which both yourself and it are not so separate. And I'm very intrigued on that because it would appear that possibly on the continent, and let's say uh, Germany in particular, the severance from myself and the earth has not been so relentlessly pursued. Maybe. What do you feel? Is that reasonable or? Yeah. Yeah? I feel that, the, you know, I, <laughs> I think the, G the German Green Movement, put it this way, is in has a natural inclination to understand without the amount of kind of academic research that may be required because it actually is in their soul. They get it, therefore they can move it on. How is it that it's so more successful? They're not any more intelligent, but they get it. It's in their being, unshown this kind of inseparable connection between myself and the earth. Don't know. <coughs> it's a thought. So I've called it beholding empathy, a way of engaging that includes looking at, gazing, contemplating, seeing beyond, perceiving the core, intuitive appreciation, establishing an intuitive bond. Quite a lot of words to get there for one word. <laughs> um, I'm interested in that. Because if we can't get the language right, we can't get there. Because it's language that gives us access to a new sentiment that has depth, breadth, entry. So beholding. So quite a few of us who've gone down this road of Goethean observation, Goethean perception, beholding is a highly qualitative word where in fact you have an encounter moment between the subject and yourself sorry between the object and yourself so the separation starts to break down because you enter it <coughs> John Ruskin he's not quite been re-established during the last 200 years of his anniversary because obviously he was seen as a kind of wrecker of the industrial order in the end of the Victorian period and rightly so because he said look you're going to poison yourselves you're going to have something called global warming you're going to have uh, degradation you know workers rights are going to be completely uh, um, thrown out and if you don't put a minimum wage in, it took a hundred years, people will be exploited. So, but he did say one interesting thing, which is the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for what, for what, can think, thousands can think for one who can see, sorry. To see clearly is poetry, prophecy, religion, all in one. So this, this kind of seeing isn't about exact observation. It's about seeing. And Rudolf Steiner had a few things to say as well in his concept of universe, earth and people. So how do you join it back up together as the parts have been so clearly and skillfully separated out. And he developed something called biodynamic agriculture. And behind the idea of a bi behind, behind the idea of agri 
agricultural, was this concept of building an organism in which the agricultural individuality is expressed. You could say the genus loci of the farm. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary idea. I mean, it's so counter-cultural and intuitive in the 1920s when everything was going into an industrial model. So biodynamics may be considered the interaction between the natural world, universe and human consciousness. Nature changes how it acts. It makes nature unnatural. This is where my green friends get very upset with me. I've had more contentious arguments around this than probably anything else I've done in my life. How can you do this? Well, can't you see that we have the power to recreate things? We have the ability to use our consciousness in such a way that we can enter it. We can co-relate at a deepest level so that we might, this is not just the arrogant, fulfill its potential. And we've been doing it for hundreds of years. So every apple that's grown in Persia and through the Worcestershire Vales, they were crab apples. And what the Cistercian monks did is to put an apple in their cloister after their prayer and walk around the apple tree. And they tried to reimagine its potential so that you got a royal Worcester or whatever it was. So all our variety of apples yeah, they're reimagined out of consciousness and devotion and love, not manipulation, seeing how it could perform something new. <coughs> the quality of consciousness may act as transformation for the natural world. That's what they did. We have the power, and this is really tricky, as in GM, to recreate nature. With BD, agricultural individuality and imagination, we may gain permission to create that which is yet to be created, a new imaginable power, but not based on manipulation, based on cooperation, entering into the being of the dandelion to see whether it can be still yet more dandelionness. <laughs> Give you that as an idea. <coughs> and. Um, Owen Barfield, who's quite well read in the US. He was a local barrister from London, and he got many of um, Goethe's ideas. I go into the natural world as a participatory observer rather than a spectator observer to become a seer, to have imaginations. Owen Barfield called this a new participatory consciousness. So you're not looking at it, you're inside it, and you're separate at the same time. I think psychology calls it the depressive position. You're in it, but you're not. You're outside it, you can see it, you're beholding it. You're watching yourself in the act of perception. So these are some of the leading thoughts behind the genus loci. And there's a training for it. And there are new ways of entering to resolve some of the most intractable, challenging, complex issues of our time that have been entirely the result of a one-sided entry into nature um, with many consequences, both positive and generally more negative, of course, at the moment. So, I had a very good friend called Dr. Margaret Kalkoon and she set up the um, Life Science Centre, just south of Edinburgh. And it's recently come into the Ruskin Mill Trust because it sort of slightly fell apart after her death. And she was a doctor of biology. And she tried to use some of Goethe's way of entering the world of nature. And she called it Beholding the, nature, Beholding the World of Nature. And she wrote a book called New Eyes for Plants. So it's a brilliant book. And she really did a, a, a she tried to develop a centre for the study of plants. 
<coughs> and she developed uh, a sevenfold process, which has been further worked on by a wonderful lady called Isis Brook, Dr. Isis Brook, and there are eight copies of her article from which I've basically developed my talk. Okay. And Dr. Isis Brook um, put together a master's at Lancaster University, just a module, which some of the Ruskimo staff undertook, and it was transformative, actually, to go through that master's. So there are eight copies here. Julia said if you want any more, then she will print it out. So um, Isis Brook was taught by Dr. Margaret Cocoon, and Dr. Margaret Cocoon, I'm one of her pupils, the late Margaret Cocoon. And she gave me some really interesting new <laughs> insights into how to enter the place, enter the plant. Not looking at, but being a co-participant in the act of knowing the plant or the location. So you collect, stage one, you collect the information, mineral, plant, animal and human. And I've just done a little short exercise on how that might look at Wrighton, here, right now. It's terribly simple, but it is very important because it has a method. And so when Ruskin Mill put the Horsley Valley under its responsibility, um, we went through this process and we had about eight or nine people in each group and it's just basically going down to the library or going onto the internet or actually then interviewing local people actually at a certain point um, and collecting the information. The question is how far back do you want to go? How much depth do you want to actually enter into? And in the case of the Ruskin Valley we went back to the ISA. It was a lot of work. Every bit of information that we brought back was worth it because the project is still regenerative, it's evolutive, it's got momentum, it's got kind of power and it's shedding its insights into the biography of those students in the valley because it's the students who've recreated the valley out of the genus loci insights. So they're co-creators of nature a new ecology of sustainability based on biographical hurt. So, then you've got to bring it all together again, stage two. That's difficult. But when you hear the results of the research about everything to do with geology, water, hydrology, and geography, with the guys who come back everything to do with the plants and the team who come back with the animal biography right back to the mammoths something happens when you start putting it back together again it's as if you're creating something new where the parts start to fit together again but it's clear it's got a ring to it and when you start finding the human history wow that's where you see the hurt. Who's done what to whom and why? How did that happen? So I did a project in Darlington. This is a tricky one. <laughs> I hope you're not from Darlington. And the one thing you can see from Darlington, if you just leave the town centre, is the football stadium that was built by a local entrepreneur who was banged up in jail for VAT fraud. So the local people were once had elevated him to the hero and now he's the bloody kind of, you know, the kind of, what would you call it, the, the wretch of the local community. Because they feel guilty walking in there. And it's not going to be taken down. So it just, you know, it's, God, what are we going to do about it? Well, you can't do anything about it, can you? There's nowhere else to go. But what are you going to do about it? Forgive the guy? And everybody hailed him as the great, you know, generator and giver of the town. So these things happen. Um, so is it a blight? It's a blight in that it's not really being acknowledged. So it's sub, it's in the subtext, it's in the unconscious of the local community. 
So, uh, bringing the parts into the whole, finding the essence. I'll give you an example of that. So, I've talked about, just mentioned dandelion. So, I did a, an exercise with some colleagues, because dandelions are part of a biodynamic preparation. And we wanted to find out, what is the quality of dandelion-ness? And to avoid personal projections, which abound, um, we put ourselves into a kind of disciplined way of strict sensorial observation. Just observe what it is. And let's hear from everybody what they see. Well, the most astonishing thing that happens, of course, is that you hear an attempt to be objective about what 15 people see as a dandelion. And what's really interesting is that six of those are fairly accurate. They reflect one after the other. And then you begin to realize that you can let other perspectives go because the six that are showing up seem to corroborate something that I didn't see. Thank you, colleagues. You've given me something that I didn't see, but I can hear is there and six of you are actually saying, boom, boom, boom. So then you do a little haiku. And you write a little poem. And you have another conversation. You distill. You go down, down, down. And suddenly, of course, this idea of the dandelion isn't particularly seen in the dandelion right down on the earth every day. But you've got a picture of dandelionness from which all dandelions come from. If you see what I mean. It's what Goethe called the archetype of the dandelion. It cascades dandelions. So when you look at a dandelion and you say, hmm, that's a particular type of dandelion grown in a stony, hard, dry place. That's a dandelion that's growing in verdant pastures. That's a dandelion. Da -da. Do you see? So you get this sense of dandelion. And it's very powerful. And if you can get a template of a dandelion that actually gives dandelion its, very, its, ver its variegated distribution, you have something that you can put as a template uh, to be able to learn to see quickly. So that's finding essence. And then you can go back into the place and say, well, who are you? Can I name you? So I did this on the on the, uh, we, we got a building with the Demographic Fund. Demographic Fund was a, quite a generous fund that the Conservatives had available for special needs colleges. We applied for it, we got it. Quite a lot of money, actually. And we bought the most beautiful building, wrecked building. We had no idea as to its uh, historical value. I think nor did the Heritage Department until we unraveled it through the Genius Loci Audit we found that it was actually one of Birmingham's first metal fabricated buildings. And that resulted, having discovered this, on a load of heritage cash. So we didn't even have to go to the bank. But we discovered that through the genus loci. And, but we didn't know how to name it. What's the name of this building? So we did a genus loci on trying to find the name. And we did lots of interesting research. At the end, we found its name. Did any one individual find it? No, it was a consensus. It's called Argent College. Argent, from silver. I mean, you think, well, that's a, that took a lot of time. And guess why couldn't you get that? Well, the idea is you couldn't, because we couldn't find a name. Yeah, so we found Argent College because it was a college, actually, that worked predominantly with silver engineering. Um, so Argent College is the name that we found. So who are you? We could name you. May we have permission to recreate you? Now, again, I can lose a lot of people at this point. <laughs> who are you? May I have permission to recreate you? You might have to do that. May I, have, may I have permission to recreate you? See, what's happened now is that you've endowed this place 
or this situation with being, with soul. It's what the poets do, it's what the artists do. And that's not a verbal response. There is no voice, as you and I would know about it. Not the voice between my relationship, my discourse with you now. But it's an iteration of events. Events happen, as we all know. Things happen. And it's our job to read the script of events. Do you know, it's something that a lot of people don't really take seriously. They say, well, that's a coincidence. No, it isn't. These things are happening all the time. And if you're aware of your own biography and its, and its events, suddenly you might find there's a load of cohesion in those sequence of events. There's a load of cohesion. But how are you going to differentiate between <coughs> fantagorial stuff and the real stuff on the ground? The only way to do that is to have inter-collaboration with your colleagues. Because your colleagues hold you to account. We hold each other to account. It's very powerful. <coughs> if you invite them, put it under the scrutiny of what Dr. Isis Brooks calls intersubjective verification. Beautiful term. So the person comes in, but each one is actually scrutinizing the other. And something emerges. It's unavoidable. You know what the answer is. You can go into denial. But it's pretty clear. So you find the name. You might find the message, yes. But it might be like this. <coughs> then you have to do the manifestation of the intention. So what I've done <coughs> is to simply take you through this stage one here. There is not an equal level of time in each of these seven stages. Some of these can be very quick indeed. But this one takes time. If you want to get in there, you get, that takes time. That takes effort. That takes a lot of effort to put it back together again. But these could be very quick, depending on the scale and what the project is. So if we want to find the essence of this place here, it would take a group of about 15 people over a period of time, determined by you how much scrutiny you want to go into. But something will happen. And the colleagueship that is generated in terms of owning the insights is transformative. What it did at Ruskin Mill was to form a faculty of commitment to the project. Do you know that's the greatest gift? That's the greatest economy you can have? A committed group of human beings to do a project together. And you know you'll put yourself, you can put your, your differences aside because this is so important. It kind of dis it distills what the really important things are from oh, the interpersonal crap. Just look, put it aside. This is really key. So this is how I do it. I put Goethe as my inspiration. I put Hildegard of Bingham back up there. I put BD in there <coughs> because I want universe earth and people. So I'm going to put the stars there. They have rhythms and cycles. The moon has influence. The moon is a very dynamic <coughs> organizer of hydrology, both in the plant and in the tides and in the world, and, and in the a world of um, liquid formation. And I don't need to do anything with it, but I'm making it just present. I'm then going to organize, just like the old Celts did, get the air right. Get the fire right, get the water right, get the earth right. What are the coordinates? And you can take many different perspectives. And, uh, there's no one right perspective. But in the one that I do, I tend to put air in the north, earth in the south, water in the west, and fire in the east. We need to go through another talk to give you the rationale for that. But that's the template. And it's a vessel. I'm going to fill this vessel at Wrighton Gardens. I need to find out. So I'm going to do a bit of an exploration on the geology. And what I found was really interesting in Warwickshire. 
and envious coming from Gloucestershire. Very monotonous. Elias Clay and Carver and and uh, calcium carbonate. <coughs> That's not quite true. On the west, there's a little bit of sandstone. But. So, what does the what does the land look like? The geology of the land, the weather, and the climate. Have a group of eight or nine people, and you just assign different parts of the project, and you know, might do water, hydrology, um, water tables, spring lines. Spring lines are important. And you can. I'm sure you can appreciate for that. And, you know, bring all the different parts together. And then you've got your mineral picture of the land. Now, it would depend on whether you want to go 50 miles out from here or 10 miles out from here. But even if you could appreciate Warwickshire as a county, that's helpful. But what's really clear is what's underneath the CSA. Because you're actually eating it every day. It's in the plants. What is there? What's coming up from the soil? Next one. Have a look at the bioregion. The plants, the water, the influence of light and warmth. What's the history? What type of plants have really contributed to the economy, or in the case of Birmingham, the soil was so poor that it was the place for the Industrial Revolution. There was no claim on the land because the soils were so poor. It's really interesting. Eh? A few sheep, but even they suffered. <laughs> so it was like a natural, uh, it was a kind of high, it's 500 feet high, Birmingham, and it's actually bloody cold in winter relative to Persia. They get five days of more snow than they do just down the road in Kidderminster. That's quite a lot. Five days of lying snow relative to Kidderminster, which has practically nothing. So all these sort of things start to, so there is a plant, there's a plant deficiency, you could say, in Birmingham, which actually gave rise to very cheap land to be able to build industrial development. That was interesting. The animals. I didn't know that there were red squirrels in Warwickshire. Should have done. Really intrigued. I thought they were only in the Lake District. So that's interesting. How the weirds, how's the red, red squirrel survived in Warwickshire? <coughs> And in a way, you can say the soul of the, the landscape is embodied in the animals because what happens with human beings is that we insole them. They br they, we bring them into our community. We co-create a community called a <coughs> farm through our relationship with the animal. Those are dependent on the life of the plants, and the life of the plants are very often entirely dependent on the physical geology, dot, dot, dot. So this, this building up of uh, context together, and then human identity. Human biography of location, significant personalities. I'm always interested in the young people. I'm always interested in the influence of the young people of the millennium. Really interested. What are we doing for them? What do they need? What are they asking for? Hugely important. They're constantly overlooked. How do we cater for their needs? How do we help them actually constitute this displacement of virtual relationships? How do we actually bring soul identity to community and sense of belonging? How do we deal with the double? So the impact, I call it, unethical practice, deceit, whatever, you cannot ignore it. So <coughs> having worked with young people who are bearers of toxic human relationships, that's there. What am I going to do about it? 
how am I going to actually help that location which has also had a, a perpetration against it, a hurt, and the uh, history and the biography of those young people. Um, well, my discovery is that when they shake hands, transformation takes place. It's not on a didactic level, it's on a performative level. You create something new that didn't exist, and the hurt drops away. It's replaced with recognition and um, goodwill and appreciation. And the place needs appreciation. So how many hurt places are there? They need reappreciating. That's the genus loco. Human destiny. Tricky stuff, as we know. So um, I was given a piece of land which was um, a, head, a headland, a kind of inland headland between the River Tees and the River uh, Croft. No, Croft on Tees. Croft on Tees. God, yeah. And these two rivers had a confluence right here. So we went to the confluence. This is the nose of the land. This is the group. And we were taking notes. May not look like it. Everything was being observed. Plants, stones, speed of the river, the type of gravel. Um, this is a fantastic photograph. Um, this is Julian Christie, my fundraiser. She's got millions for the trust. Because she can do dum -dum, the, right, the right thing at the right time uh, in government grants. So she's a genius loci, genius on grant filling. Because she gets it done on time, in the right context, and can do the case for support. And she got the two and a half billion from Ed Bulls to buy this land, basically, for youth at risk in Darlington. <coughs> so we then went back into the genus loci and built up just exactly what I've taken you through. And it's a very, it was a very difficult place because it's been in a landlord for 800 years. You know, I thought a 100-year land program was quite smart on myself until I met this guy who went 800 years. And what happens to a family who owns land for 800 years, well, you, I'll leave you to think about it. Quite remarkable the power that lives between the landed family lineage and that land. Quite remarkable to meet. Anyway, so uh, we were given a lease. We weren't given anything. And so we had some leased land, then we bought some land, and we had to put this leased land and this inherited land together. Still tricky. And it's now a centre. It's taken many years to put together because it's not far from Catterick, which is Europe's largest military base. The suffering in that military base, really tricky stuff. The hierarchies, the social, it's called living in, mil living in a military establishment. It's a lot of social abuse. Not, it's, not, it's, it's perpetrated in the action of a military establishment. They can't help it. It just happens. So the wives with the special needs kids or children who are not quite performing well just get tossed out. We pick them up. So we have a military family centre called the Fold. And this land is enfolded. And what we discovered in this walk was trying to find the potential of this place. And when we actually could give it its signature and its name, we got even more money. <laughs> I'm not saying this is a money spinner, because it's all to do with motivation. But money comes. There's no question of it. If you have a clear task and a vision and a solution to intractable issues, and they're not just social, they're environmental as well. So this is the first stage of collecting the data. Now let's go. <sighs> Look at this. 
So when I saw this, I thought, whoa. Oh, this is menacing. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still reeling from it. Just look at that. What's that telling us? This ever-expanding, radiating, urban development. There's this little spot here. So when I got this, I mean, I only, you know, just I only looked at it three days ago, and I'm still haunted by it. I'll let you, I need to let you know. So it's really powerful stuff. So you're working on the edge of this expanding conurbation. I can't see it not expanding. And you've got a vision. In fact, many of the issues in here are being researched on the outskirts of this conurbation. In fact, just about everything that this expanding conurbation requires is living in this little centre here. But it's performative as well. It's not just theoretical. For me, this is an amazing opportunity as an entrepreneur. So what else do you... What else? I mean, I'm going jumping now, so I'm saying, what are the potentials? It's unlimited. That was my first impression. So, did a little bit of a geological element. Warwickshire is a beautiful, beautiful county. It's got a beautiful shape. Warwick is right in the centre. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of extending series of towns around it. And it's got this carboniferous rock, like a plume, all the way down the middle. This is where you belong. This is your political boundary. And then it's got another little plume, that blue plume. It's like a fruit. So you've got this core, Precambrian rock. Carboniferous. Triassic clay, early Jurassic clays, younger Jurassic stone sands, probably from the glacial periods. No, that's actually Gloucestershire, I think. Well, this is see Gloucestershire seeping in. <laughs> that's, uh, I go, this is so beautiful. So where do I live on this plume of rock, this diversity? So I then did a bit more work and say, there are hundreds of quarries in. Warwickshire. They're mining you out. Home and well, I, know, I can see why. <laughs> Precambrian rock, right in the heart of England. You need Precambrian rock. You need limestone for cement. You need clay for all the bricks. And you couldn't have it better. So a lot of your industrial element will be based on mining the ground, just as um, Francis Bacon said, you can take what you want, do what you want, it's yours, make you great again. <laughs> so that was very interesting and um, it's got a, yeah, as I said, it's got a, it's got a beautiful, it's got a beautiful form. So right up here, Precambrian, oh, oh, look, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. No city on it there, that's interesting. No town on it. Well, particularly big anyway. No, there we go. Yeah. Okay, oh well. You see? Now that was a code I don't understand. <laughs> okay. One of the most varied selections of rocks in the country from Precambrian to the gravels that formed during the Pleistocene, you could say if you've got roadstone, <laughs> you've got limestone for cement, and you've got the gravels, you've got the basis of big industrial development, actually. Well, it's not that big, but it's, that's the... Um, 
fossils, including the Cambrian tribolites, Jurassic invertebrates, and Wilmcode plesiosaur. I've heard about that. <laughs> Have you heard, anyone seen the Wilm? The plesiosaur? Yeah, it's interesting. So that's a signature of an ancient past, you see. And if you want to go, if you want to go back, um, and I did another genus loci quite recently where we went back right to the Earth's formation of the continental plates because a place that I was doing a genus loci was on a continental plate. We had to get, we had to be clear about. It. So which plate are you really on? And it's are you in the west, eastern plate or the western? Let's be clear. Are you going east? Are you going west? Or southeast? So I think it's important, and it's also important to know where in the geographical boundary of the Earth where the sandstones were formed, because they are usually going to be formed somewhere north of the equator or south of the equator. So the sandstones that you do have around here, which are connected to Hereford, I think we're of Devonian origin. Well, those, are the, those were the sandstones that were formed when the Earth, when this part of Britain was at 20 degrees north of the equator. It's interesting. Feel yourself part of the whole development of the continental drift. You might say, is that really necessary? You don't have to do it, but you know, it's an interesting exercise to do it. And when I have done it with colleagues, they say that was really helpful. I got a better sense of orientation. Um, right, let's go on. So for me, this is very interesting. So where are you now? Where are we now on this map? That's the bit I didn't do. Uh, Coventry. Where's Coventry? Oh, yeah. So we're... Uh, ah, right. So do you think we're here or there? No, but south. Oh, south. Oh, God, I've done it again. Right, so you're on the Carboniferous Rock. Sort of there, aren't we? In we're talking closer to the road. Triassic. Okay, so we're here then. There you go. Do you know what? It's really important to know where you are. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? We're on the edge of the Avon. We're on a riverbed. It's You're on a riverbed. Okay. Yeah. So there you've got a conglomerate, yeah. probably, yeah. of yeah. of history. I think it's very important, yeah. And also where the rivers come from. Because if the river did come from the Precambrian, you'll be having these beautiful, silicious little pebbles in your riverbed. Yeah, no, it comes from the Doesn't. It comes from the right? Okay. Well, get right, the okay. So it's coming from <laughs> Jurassic clays and limestones, yeah. Okay. So, so what was interesting when we were in the riverbed, we had one, because it was a confluence, we had one riverbed from the local geology, and then we had another riverbed from the lead mining area of the Peak District. So I didn't have so much time to do on this, so I found this rather nice. So you're in Shakespeare country. I know the bank where the wild thyme blows where the oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with lush woodbine, with sweet musk roses and eglatine. It's all there. Those are his local flowers. It's in Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, where did he write that? Was it here? I don't know, but it's important. I'd like to know that. Because Midsummer Night's Dream, in my way of decoding what Shakespeare was doing, and you can take this as my opinion, okay, so, was that he gave us, the English audience, the last visage, visage of the shamanic druid culture, which was obliterated just before Francis Bacon. Some of the druids were living in central England in their oak trees up until 1500. Well, no, no. And they were the protectors of the landscape. They took charge of the energetic fields of nature. 
and there was no way they could survive the onslaught of bacon. So my understanding is that they disassembled, closed down, left. The landscape was then left for a new group of people to take charge and reanimate it. And in my view is that you're part of it. There's a new resurgence of care and tension and love for the landscape. The genus loci is a starting point to reanimate that which our ancestors <coughs> had to leave behind due to the adversity in which they would be burnt at the stake and the rest of it. Because that's what happened. If you stuck your neck out, and so it was obliterated. So <coughs> he gave us this picture of the whole world of Titania, the kind of world behind the world of um, the spirit life of nature. So Midsummer Night's Dream is exactly what it says, but it's more powerful than that. It's a visage of Shakespeare's genius of looking into the ancient heritage of Albion. Okay, animals. I didn't have any time, but I'd love to be able to articulate more clearly, you know, in a timeline, what were the key animals that came around this area? And the only one I really found was the red squirrel. Well, did I put it in there? No, I didn't. Yeah, including the red squirrel. <coughs> Um, let me do you an example of how important the animals are. So I was asked to give a, do a 45 teachers in a school in Shining Mountain up in the Colorado steppe. And um, a teacher had written to me and said, uh, Mr. Gordon, I, I hear you do genus loci audits and sometimes you can do it on the human interaction between colleagues. I said, Sometimes I do. Okay. So uh, they pleaded for me to come along and actually do the genus loci. And so I looked into it. We had teams working. And one guy elected to go and find out what the first people were doing on this spot, just behind the school. And he found something extraordinary. It happened to be a little, behind the school was a little ravine where the young adolescent boys were taught by their elders to play coup with the buffalo. And as part of their training, they had to identify with the buffalo, so they had to become buffalo, not young boys. So they had to go in a kind of, they had to understand what the buffalo ness was. And so they chased the buffalo, and they chased the buffalo because if they were seen or felt by the buffalo, the buffalo would go in a different direction. The idea was to get the buffalo over the edge and killed for the next meal. So it's pretty brutal stuff. So they chased the buffalo down this ravine and killed the buffalo. The issue that the teachers had is that they kill each other every Thursday evening when they meet to try and run this school. They argue. And this guy had discovered that that activity and that act with the young people over centuries might have a connection. And when he pointed it out to the teachers, they stopped immediately. Five years later, I wrote to them and said, how's it going? We've never argued. We won't do it. Now that we've seen we were caught in the double of the place. So powerful. So I think, you know, the more I do this, the more I see that Actually, you can unravel this very important relationship in what might be called the soul of the locality. Okay, this one here. So, then I put in Henry Doubleday. Who's this guy? What an amazing guy. God, we owe him so much. So what was he all about? What was motivating? What was his background? Where did he go to school? How did he end up thinking so far ahead of what other people were doing? Henry Doubleday was a Quaker smallholder who brought comfort to Britain. Do you know, I thought, 
Well, thank you. <laughs> what a brilliant! I mean, so we, we got, you know, you're sitting on the la on a place of genius. That's all I can say. Unravel unraveled potential. And this was an interesting one, which was set up in a, to protect hundreds of vegetable varieties endangered by new EU regulations. So if we're not in the EU now, what are we going to do about that? Are we going to destroy them all because we've got free market economy? <laughs> oh. Where do we go? Oh! Um, there you go. And look at the publicity. Right? What's this? The Garden Organic for School scheme involves 10% of all schools in the UK. I didn't know that. So, I think you're if you go back from where you are, back into the human history, there is so much to discover, so much to build on, so much potential to reimagine the potential of this place. Thank you very much.